morning, good afternoon to all the participants for the session. Uh, the importance for the decision emanates from the realization of nutrition as an outcome of a food system and a shift from when malnutrition was considered as a problem to be addressed entirely by the public health system. The complex challenges to address issues related to ensuring food and nutrition security calls for greater synergy and coherence in public policy formulation and implementation across sectors, supported by more strategic investments from both the public and private sectors. This means that silo solutions are no longer an option. What is required is an integrated portfolio of policies, investments, and legislation, built along with the context-specific transformation pathways that can specifically address food security and nutrition challenges. Market-led solutions, therefore, are needed to ensure sustained access to effective and affordable nutritious products and services at scale to entire population. We've seen how these market-led solutions have enabled food system transformation in terms of either intervening along the food supply chain to lower the cost of nutritious foods, or scaling up climate resilience across food systems, or even strengthening food environments and changing consumer behavior to promote dietary patterns with positive impact on human health and the environment. These approaches have been adopted in the large-scale programs supported by various governments or the development financial institutions across various countries. We have examples such as the Right Food, Right Time program in Zambia, Mozambique, Kenya, Nepal, wherein WFP has leveraged DSN, Royal DSN expertise in nutrition and food technology, economics, marketing and communication, and for strengthening its humanitarian food delivery expertise. The partnership leverages the logistics reach and food delivery expertise of a global organization with the industry expertise of a global science company to better combat global malnutrition. Market led solutions have also Which means that if you send, if we send from our registration. Market led solutions have also supported the provisioning of micronutrients through food fortification and promoting good nutritional practices for pregnant lactating women, infants, and young children. Appropriate consumer education and promotion of nutritious products has helped caretakers make informed choices. And here we have the examples such as Project Laser Beam, which has been run in Indonesia and Bangladesh, where five key partners, World Food Program, Unilever, Kraft Foods, Royal DSM, and the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition Gain are embracing a multi-stakeholder model to ensure activities that are most appropriate for the local situation by encompassing a holistic approach to nutrition that includes food fortification, breastfeeding and complementary feeding promotion, health and hygiene promotion, and also creating a new model for public-private partnership that is scalable, replicable, and sustainable for use in other countries. These and many such examples have demonstrated evidence on the potential of market-based solutions to increase access to nutrition products and services, and presents a case for these solutions being considered as an integral part of the overall approach to fight under nutrition. Having said that, the journey of success for a nice, any solution has its own share of challenges and learnings. Therefore, our panelists in the session will dwell upon their experiences in addressing challenges related to food and nutrition security and touch upon strategic pathways that can A, strengthen the capacity of social enterprises and B, accelerate achievement of food security and improve nutritional outcomes at local, regional, and global level. In here, I would like to turn the spotlight on our first speaker, Nick, who represents BOP Inc. BOP Inc., through the power of entrepreneurship, help organizations to deliver inclusive and commercially viable business solutions. One of their intervention, Two Scale, is an incubator program that manages a portfolio of public-private partnerships for inclusive business in agri-food sector. Two Scale offers a range of support services to its business champions, which are SMEs, farmer groups, and partners, enabling them to produce, transform, and supply quality food products. These products go to local and regional markets, including to the base of the pyramid consumers. 
over to you next. Thank you so much, Rahul. And of course, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, Rahul, thank you for the intro. That was a, was a whole mouthful. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit more indeed of what, we're, uh, what we'll be doing. Uh, I'll just share my screen so we have some visuals as well. Um, Rahul asked if we could uh, introduce ourselves and some of the intervention we're doing. Uh, so we'll start a little bit generic about who we are and what we do. Um, and then gradually, we'll also help to share some more practical examples and models of what we do in terms of uh, uh, our nutrition interventions. Um, so as Rahul already said, uh, as Bopping, we support startups and multinationals uh, to design and deliver commercially and social viable business models. Um, and what, what that means for us is that we're trying to bridge the, the gap between private and, and development sectors. And specifically on nutrition, this means that we work uh, both with larger multinationals in, in the food domain, but also with a, local, a lot of local uh, SMEs and cooperatives uh, to basically achieve the same. Uh, that you'll also see in, um, sorry, I'm just fixing. That you'll also see in the partners that we work with. Uh, so here you see a sort of wide variety on for-profit uh, partners that we work with, but also non-profit partners that often make it actually, uh, that allow us to work with local SMEs and cooperatives as well, uh, as you probably know. And this, I think, uh, provides us an interesting set of experiences on how to tackle the, the challenges and subjects around nutrition, uh, looking at these different companies and the different ap approaches they apply. Um, as Bob Inc., we work in a number of countries. We have about 70 people now. Uh, most of our work is actually in Asia and East and West uh, Africa. Um, and the examples that we mentioned today will be specifically around um, um, the African continent, where we also have our largest uh, program around nutrition, which is called TuScale, uh, which we'll also talk more about. So if we talk more about what we do specifically on nutrition, these are our key uh, three areas that we have our interventions on, uh, inclusive innovation, marketing and distribution, and inclusive business empowerment. So what this means in nutrition is that on the inclusive, inclusive innovation side, uh, this is actually where we support organizations to develop new products and services that, that uh, can serve local markets. Uh, marketing and distribution is when companies actually do have a product, but need to find a way to market and distribute it uh, locally. Um, and our interventions are often geared to support uh, supply products for the base of the pyramid. Um, and as you might know, uh, reaching those in the last mile can be a, a challenge in itself. Uh, so we'll talk about a little bit more about that later. And the third pillar is IB empowerment. And that's actually where we train and capacitate uh, both local SMEs, but also international players on how to best uh, run their business and, and, and serve uh, these markets. Uh, so in this uh, three domains, we try to apply sort of our fee five uh, rules, as we call them. Um, and we think that they're vital, again, also when you look on the nutritional aspect. Uh, so to first, of course, have a very consumer-centered approach, uh, making sure that put, they're put on the first spot uh, in all our interventions, making sure we're local and action-oriented and be innovative and agile. Uh, then we have trying to make sure that all these partners dance together um, and trying to make sure that we have a, a solid business case at all times. Um, and I think also when you look at sort of the nutrition, this, the top three uh, rules I think are, are quite important. Of course, we all know a lot of interventions as well that might be more on a, a governmental or policy level, uh, but sometimes just miss the spot when it comes to actually serving um, the, the actual people at the BOP that need nutrition the most. Um, a little bit more specific on, on some of the things that we, we try to apply when working in the nutrition domain is when you look on the right side of the slide, uh, we find these three areas, you know, key. Um, uh, sort of on the top, uh, the top circle is that we, what we talk about is making sure we have a relevant value proposition. So making sure that the products actually meet the consumer needs and wants. Uh, this is also where, again, this consumer centered approach applies. Uh, but the other two areas that are key is to think through your distribution channel, uh, making sure you think through how to reach the end consumer. Um, and the third one is to make sure you incorporate market dynamics and make sure you have a strong marketing approach. Uh, this also includes, you know, building an appealing message to, to reach your end consumer. Um, 
and uh, in some of the projects we'll, we'll, we'll try to show you how we address these three domains um, and yeah if we then look at the first the top the top Venn diagram on the top so when we talk about the consumer part this is where we actually go pretty much uh, or ha have a pretty detailed approach so this is, for instance, where we try to really map what the aspirations uh, of our end consumers are, how their daily life looks like, uh, what influencers are there in the community that influence, you know, what 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 products they or nutrition products they can consume, uh, but also understand their purchasing um, uh, habits um, uh, and ability. Uh, so these are some of the subjects we would then explore. If we then go to the other two domains, so distribution and marketing. Uh, this is where we really go in depth on sort of the what, when, and where, and how can we actually bring this product to market. Uh, I won't go in depth uh, for now. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, we also apply a wide range of different sort of methods and tools, uh, specifically on, around behavior change. Um, again, I just wanted to show you this, and perhaps it can be an interesting read after. Um, where you really think through how a specific product uh, uh, can be sort of what how, what strategies can you apply to make sure that the end consumer actually does uh, try to update the product and and um, yeah what are certain models that you can apply to to increase that uh, likelihood that's so to say and then lastly I just wanted to mention an example uh, that I think really resonates. And this is also an intro to my colleague Shitandi, who will talk more about this program. Uh, under uh, one of our programs called Two Skill, we supported an uh, SME in Ethiopia. Um, originally, this uh, business was primarily um, uh, supplying products to governments, uh, so a World Food Program with fortified corn soy blend and those type of um, institutional sort of products. Uh, but under the support of Two Skill, uh, this business actually launched a B two C product, including uh, a, a new brand, a new marketing campaign. Uh, but what's also interesting was that they actually set up their own distribution model, uh, working with sales agents, as you can see here, uh, um, which were all female. Uh, so this also provided a great opportunity uh, to make sure that even the gender component was actually pushed in this nutritional intervention. Um, and I think this is just a very interesting case. Again, if, you, if you're looking for interesting examples, um, Guts Agro in Ethiopia, I think, uh, sort of speaks speaks a lot to that. Um, now I'd like to give the floor to Shitandi, who'll talk a little bit more about Two Scale, um, as we believe that this is a program that really shows how, uh, you know, as Bopping, we try to apply all these um, methodologies in practice in more detail. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shitandi. Uh, thank you, Nick. So um, I'm program manager for Two Scale on the Bopping side. Uh, you'll understand that in a few minutes. Um, what, what is Two Scale really? Um, the acronym Two Scale stands for Towards Sustainable um, Agribusiness Clusters Through Learning and Entrepreneurship. And as Rahul said during the introduction, uh, we are an incubator and accelerator program that manages a portfolio of public-private partnerships for inclusive businesses in agri-food sectors and industries. Definitely a mouthful, um, but I think um, one, one of the key things about to scale is inclusiveness, inclusivity. And um, I'll talk about that more and how it influences um, our interventions and what we do uh, um, in the different countries that we are in. So, uh, there was phase one of two skill, which was from 2012 to 2017. We are currently in phase two, uh, which will run from 2019 to 2023. Um, two skill is funded uh, by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, 50 million euros. And we aim to leverage another 50 million uh, from private sector contribution. So this funding is purely to provide technical assistance to partners. We don't give any, any kind of subsidies. Um, to scale is implemented by a consortium of partners. We have s and um, IFTC, and, and Bopping. And we are currently running in eight countries in Africa, um, Kenya, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Ghana, 
Ivory Coast, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali. And most recently in 2021, uh, we started pilots in South Sudan and, and Egypt. Um, we are in four different, um, I mean, we, class, we put them together, uh, let me call them uh, sectors. So we have dairy and animal products to give you some context, uh, poultry, milk, uh, staple crops, things like sorghum, cassava, uh, maize. We have fresh, fresh produce, uh, potatoes and vegetables, and then oil seeds, things like groundnuts and, and soya. Nick? So how, how does two scale work? Um, really, we focus on establishing agribusiness clusters around business champions. And business champions can be uh, producer organizations. As an example, cooperatives, a dairy cooperative, uh, it could be a local SME that trades or processes uh, farmer produce. In this case, it can be an aggregator already in the market, or it could be a food processor. So what the program does is it supports these champions to develop uh, products for low-income consumers, uh, BOP consumers. Uh, on the agribusiness cluster part, really, when you, when you look at... Um, Food, food and nutrition security, you cannot leave out the production side. So how to scale is structured. We have people, organizations we call business support services who help to develop the production side to ensure that there's sufficient uh, produce for, for the market. Nick. All right. So Objectives of two scale. Um, I know the, the session for today is on food and nutrition security. Uh, two scale is not a food and nutrition security program per se, but we contribute greatly towards uh, this course. And in the following ways, uh, catalyzing inclusive and sustainable growth in the agricultural sector. So that's for local and regional value chains, uh, reducing existing hunger and malnutrition through improved access to nutritious food for base of the pyramid consumers. And probably later, um, I'll talk more about what kind of products, how we go about doing it. Um, of course, you cannot do all of these things without um, creating opportunities for youth and women around entrepreneurship and employment. And also um, facilitate ecologically sustainable and productive food systems. So if I, if, if I look at, if I talk about food and nutrition security, just to paraphrase what FAO say, you know, this is when all individuals have reliable access to sufficient quantity, quantities of affordable, nutritious food to lead a healthy life. And there are four pillars, four dimensions uh, for this to happen. You have to look at availability, where sufficient food is produced. You have to look at access. Um, this food that is produced, is it affordable uh, once it's processed? Is, is it processed? And is it available uh, to the consumer? Uh, the third dimension is access. Um, you know, there must be sufficient resources to obtain appropriate food for a nutritious and culturally suitable diet. And then um, there's utilization and stability. So when I look at all of those things and I look at how to scale is structured, we do address a lot of the challenges that. Um, are encompassed in the four dimensions. And we, we don't call ourselves uh, a, food and a food and nutrition security uh, program, but we contribute greatly. Um, our goals as two skill is to improve access to nutritious food for 1 million consumers. Um, and this is through all the business champions that we work with. And uh, you know, we, we want to achieve this by at least working with 40 BOP markets um, across the, the, the 10 countries that we are in. Um, 750,000 smallholder farmers with 50% of them being women and 40% youth. Uh, if I take you back, I said, the key thing about to scale is how inclusive we are. Um, the third goal is to develop inclusive businesses uh, with 5,000 micro small uh, SMEs. This is to ensure that there is enough, um, there's, a, there's structure and there are enough uh, businesses 
to support the movement of uh, products from the smallholder farmer, I mean, from production, all the way through processing and into distribution. And finally, we aim to achieve all of these goals by um, working with 60 private partnerships uh, help them scale. Thank you. So um, as, a, as a small example, uh, we have uh, Shalem. And Shalem were part of Two Skill One. Uh, like I mentioned, we're in Two Skill Two now. And they start, when we started working with Shalem as Two Skill, they were mainly an aggregator. And we worked, we worked with them through the journey from being an aggregator supplying a very large off-taker. In this case, it was uh, East African Breweries Limited. I was for beer and she was, she's in the Sogam value chain. And we worked with her through uh, being able to build up uh, reserves, being able to, um, um, what's the word? Um, being able to supply consistently to her large off taker, to moving on to actually starting her own processing line. And of course, along, along the way, there were, there were many challenges uh, when it came to uh, farmers, when it came to uh, even just the business environment. But as of now with Shalem, um, she's been able to uh, create products for, for the local market. And this is specifically porridge. And at this point, we are supporting her to scale. Though she, we exited the partnership, but we are giving her something that we call low intensity support, where she's now accessing um, She's asking financing to, to scale her business. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, uh, uh, Shitandi. Uh, thank you for highlighting the production aspect and also in terms of ensuring access to nutritious food and in terms of the business models that you've created, uh, which are more inclusive. Uh, let's now move on our focus to another uh, social enterprise, which is now more looking at strengthening the marketing perspective and also from the consumption aspect. I would now invite Eddie from Frontier Nutrition. Uh, Frontier Nutrition develops, manufactures, and markets innovative, delicious, fortified snacks that satisfies the craving and meet the nutritional needs of millions of families in low-income countries and communities around the world. Over to you, Eddie. Thanks so much, Rahul. Uh, um, so it's a, a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rahul, and to the whole team at, at Shankalp for organizing this session. Um, and thanks also to the, to the folks at, at Bob Inc. For, for sharing their work. Uh, it's really inspirational. Um, and I, I look forward to learning more. Um, so my name is Eddie and I'm the co-founder of uh, and CEO of Frontier Nutrition and I'm delighted to share a little bit about our efforts to treat and prevent malnutrition in Bangladesh through delicious and affordable fortified packaged snacks. So with 180 million people and an average GDP growth rate of close to 8% over the last decade, Bangladesh is among the largest and fastest growing economies in the world. As the economy grows and preferences change, the snack food industry has become one of the best performing sectors, well outpacing uh, even really high secular GDP growth. Uh, this economic growth has translated to substantially higher incomes and a better standard of living for all Bangladeshis over the last 30 years. As you can see in the figure on the left, incomes have doubled and childhood stunting has been cut in half since 1985. However, as you can see on the right, malnutrition remains at an alarmingly high rate, especially for women and children, and specifically for key micronutrients like vitamins A, B12, and D, and minerals like zinc and iron. It's estimated that malnutrition causes half of deaths of children under five worldwide. That's 2.6 million children globally and 55,000 in Bangladesh every year. Between increased healthcare costs, more time spent sick and convalescing, lower productivity and wages and other knock-on effects, experts estimate malnutrition reduces global economic output by $5.6 trillion a year, or just over 6.5% of global GDP. In, Bang in Bangladesh, 
This equates to more than $21 billion in lost economic output every year, or more than 30% of the government's 2020 budget. Furthermore, experts estimate that nutrition-focused interventions, specifically those targeting children, adolescent girls, and pregnant and lactating women, yield extremely high returns on investment of 30 to 1. So at Frontier Nutrition, we've focused our attention on the creation of fortified snacks that commercialize two different types of well-studied tools for the treatment and prevention of malnutrition uh, among children and women specifically, lipid-based nutritional supplements and multi-micronutrient powders. While a complete summary of the existing research on the impact of LNS and MMP requires a more detailed explanation than I can provide in the short time we have together today, there is, significant there is significant evidence that these tools can meaningfully improve outcomes for children and women. So what we've done is create a range of micronutrient fortified snack products that satisfy consumer cravings and meet their budgetary constraints while providing the micronutrient content that is otherwise absent from traditional diets and common local snack foods. Uh, we significantly outperform both locally produced and imported alternatives on a price per calorie and a price per nutrient basis. Our portfolio currently includes 35 SKUs ranging from lentil butter and chocolate to soft drink powders, noodles, and biscuits. For example, one of our most popular products is a fortified lentil butter adapted from research into small quantity lipid-based nutritional supplements in Bangladesh that uses common local ingredients like lentils, chickpeas, and rice. Each sachet retails for five taka or six cents uh, which is the most common denomination for the fastest moving snack products in the country. Each sachet also contains 30% of the RDI of the 10 micronutrients most commonly absent among malnourished populations in Bangladesh. We launched commercially in January of 2019 and now have distribution to more than 70,000 outlets throughout the country. Uh, in May of 2021, consumers purchased close to 6 million units of our fortified snacks. In addition to marketing products under our own brands, we've also bit, built partnerships with two other organizations and are in talks with others to help quickly scale our impact. We've partnered with the social marketing company, the market leader for more than 30 years in contraceptives, oral rehydration solution, and other over-the-counter products uh, to develop a lentil butter that is currently rolling out across more than a quarter million outlets under the brand Super Kid Nutrition Snacks. Um, we've also partnered with the World Food Program to pilot two products a lentil butter snack for children and adolescents, and especially formulated LNS for pregnant and lactating women um, for the nearly 1 million Rohingya living in the largest refugee camps in the world outside Cox's Bazaar. Finally, we're currently working with research teams at Johns Hopkins, Columbia, ICDDRB in Bangladesh to develop and evaluate a range of innovative formulations, packaging designs, and distribution methods to identify the best tools to help treat and prevent malnutrition at scale. So thank you so much for your time and thank you especially to the team at, at the Global Summit for putting together this wonderful event and for the opportunity to speak with you all today. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about our work, please do reach out. And I look forward to, to the conversation we're gonna have now. Thank you, Adeep. Um, quite insightful. Uh, I have uh, a couple of uh, questions based on the introduction that uh, you've made. And this question is, uh, we can have first Nick uh, and uh, Shitandi answering that, and then we can follow it up with Eddie. Uh, how do you define the impact of the two scale program in numbers? And similarly for Frontier Nutrition. Okay, um, for two scale, I think uh, based on our approach, I'm going to divide this into two. I'm going to look at the impact of two scale one, because I think that's the true test of our approach and what we've been doing. And then two scale two, we're in the middle of two scale two, and I can talk about what we've been able to achieve so far. So um, let me start with two scale two and then work back to two scale one. So um, as we stand uh, today, we have formalized 62 private partnerships, uh, PPPs. And within, within those partnerships, we are supporting 43 of them to sell nutritious food to low-income consumers. And so far we have reached about 600,000 uh, BOP consumers. 
if I take you back, our target is to, you know, reach 1 million BUP consumers. Um, and to narrow down into some, some of the, what, what that looks like in, in reality. Um, in Mali, we have a dairy partnership, it's called Translate. And we helped this business champion um, develop a yogurt, vanilla and banana flavor. Uh, in Ghana, we also have uh, a partnership where we developed uh, a rice brand. Um, in Kenya, we have a partnership called Sweet and Dry, which I think is one interesting uh, partnership. And you know, if I think about latest events uh, with with COVID and what effect that has had on on our partners, I think this is one story I really like to highlight because this partnership was for African indigenous vegetables. The idea was for her to source them, dry them and sell them into the market. Uh, but because of COVID, things became quite difficult. And, you know, uh, for about uh, six months, she, you know, she was scratching her head and we were trying to think of how, you know, how else can we enhance what we are doing with uh, sweet and dry. And she came up with uh, new products, uh, nutritious porridge, uh, of course, for babies and also for, for families. So the, she dries these indigenous vegetables and she uses this powder to add onto flour for porridge. Um, and also another interesting example of how we support the, these 43 business champions is in, in Ivory Coast, we have a, a very new partnership uh, for, there's a local food called Atike, it's made out of cassava. So the challenge with Atike is that it's, it's um, consumed fresh. And this business champion for, for a while has been trying to have it um, uh, dehydrated and packed. And then usually she just sends it out for export, but she wanted to do it for local markets because in itself alone, the, the cassava uh, nutritionally is not that rich. So what we are working with her now to do is to fortify um, this dehydrated um, ATK and, and to target pregnant and lactating women. So when I say we are supporting 43 business champions, that's what the support looks like. Um, and then on the, on the production side, we've reached over 200,000 smallholder farmers uh, and we are hoping to reach more as our target is 750,000. Now to, to go to two scale, two, two scale one, um, we supported 56 partnerships in total. And after our exit, 46 of those are still active. For me, I think that's a great testament on the approach that we've taken with TwoScale. Uh, for the other 10, many, many reasons. Sometimes um, business models change and they, they decide to take a different, um, a different path. And to put more context into that, um, out of the 46, 86, I mean, 18 of them um, and two clusters signed contracts with other private actors. So what that means is that outside of what we had uh, put together as two skill to support them, they are able to attract um, or go into other markets outside of what we had already supported them to do. Um, and I think for me, one of the interesting outcomes and impact of two skill is around access to finance. Because a lot of the work that we do when we work with these SMEs is to support them and give them technical assistance to help them become um, ready for financing, right? Um, so if it's helping them with putting their books in order, um, if it's helping them to create pitch decks so that they can access funding and skill, that's part of the, part of the support that we give them. Um, half of the partnerships within Two Skill One were able to attract funding outside of, of Two Skill after we exited. And 12 of them can definitely link um, this to the two skill support. And um, going back to Shalim, so I, I mentioned that we're giving them low intensity support. And what that means is that um, obviously after we exited and we supported them because financial inclusion is one of our very, very strong pillars within two skill, we, we help them create a pitch deck. And one of the things that we still continue to do is to share that with um, you know, people who can finance, uh, if it's banks, if it's uh, uh, private investors, all of those people. 
And they were able, as part of the low intensity success, they were able to access funding from um, the Common Fund for Commodities. They were able to get a facility for five years. And also uh, even during COVID, they were still, that was, they were able to, to refinance that and they were added 100K USD uh, to help push on um, against, against COVID. And of course, when, when, when I look at all of the things that we, we did together with Shalem as he walked through the journey, when she started as an aggregator and started also now to process, she was able to build a very, very strong business case. Her books were in order and she's been able to attract funding from, from all corners. So um, that is my long answer to your question of what uh, Tuskill looks like in numbers. Uh, thanks, Rahul. Thanks, Shatan. Uh, Eddie, how do you define the impact in numbers for your enterprise? Right, so I think that there's sort of four big areas um, that we think about. Um, the first is, is as, a, as a small business, thinking about our, our revenue and our profitability. Um, so, you know, this is our third year of operation. So we're still a very young company, very young brand. Um, we did about $250,000 in sales in our first year. We did about $750,000 in 2020. Uh, and in 2021, we'll do about $2 million of, of sales. And so continuing to grow our top line um, and our profitability is really important. Uh, but it's not just for us. It's also for um, now north of 100 distributors that we're working with. Uh, and uh, now it's 70,000 retail outlets. But um, you know, soon it'll, it'll be more around the country. Uh, and so we are trying to create a unique value proposition for them in their businesses. Um, and, and a lot of the, the margin in the product is, is goes to the distributors and, and retail partners. Um, so another number that we think about is employment, um, which is related to our ability to be profitable and sustainable. You know, we're privately or we're privately funded business. Uh, and so, you know, we currently have, we currently directly employ 250 people about, um, and that number will continue to grow. Um, and there's a lot of skill development, ongoing training. Um, that's been really one of the big joys of starting this company. Um, and uh, another, another number we think about is access. So the number of, of people or of families that have access to really nutritious snack options around the country and right now we think that number is around 10 or 12 million people that have access to our products every day. Uh, but out of a population of 100 a million, 180 million, we're really just at the beginning. Um, and then obviously we think about nutritional impact. That's why we started, that's why we started the company is to, to um, demonstrate that fortified snack products can really make a difference in outcomes for kids and moms um, and not just uh, you know, government programming or the healthcare system or or uh, humanitarian efforts. Uh, and so that's much, much harder to, to, to evaluate at this stage, but that's part of the reason why we're working so hard to build partnerships with research teams, with physicians and with, uh, with researchers who are looking at, at these types of questions and um, you know, partnering with them in, in their studies to develop unique products, to you know, roll, out, uh, roll out product for their studies so that they can demonstrate the impact or, or non-impact of different products. And so that's really important. And the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, when, when folks ask about um, competition, when this particularly investors or, or people that are thinking about investors, um, they'll ask, you know, what stops any other snack food company, any of the major local snack food companies or international snack food companies from coming in and developing similar products or, or, or copying. Um, and what I say is I think that'd be great. Um, I think that if we can demonstrate that there is a, a strong business case uh, for these types of products um, and other folks uh, decide that that, that that makes sense for them too, I think that we will have achieved our goal, whether or not we're successful as a business, which of course, uh, I hope we are. So that's how we're thinking about numbers. Thanks, Eddie. And then that's an interesting, and I'll take your point. That's an interesting view, whether we realize our business goals or not, but at least in terms of the goals that, and the, or the from the ecosystem perspective, the goal that we have moved the needle 
wherein there are uh, there is an availability of an enabling environment for other uh, private sector payers or marketed approaches to also participate in the ecosystem that again is a uh, a great contribution to the to the sector but having talked about the and when when we say that the now the evidence has been generated uh, and given our experience uh, there are uh, and the way the the people or the social enterprises define scalability there could be a horizontal scale up that they may be doing or they can be looking at a vertical scale up wherein we are looking at achieving those numbers in a limited geography or expanding into wider geographies so uh, uh should be looking at and and, and I, as i also see you have a huge goal uh, uh during the course of the uh, program uh, of course we can rule out two years of covid uh, as a result the interventions may have taken a, a back step but still the the numbers are huge the, the targets are huge from 43 business champions you are looking at uh, creating close to uh, 60 uh, or rather 5000 such msmes and close to 60 private partnerships so what are your plans for uh, so a are you looking at a horizontal or a vertical scalability and what are your plans towards achieving those uh, to or rather your interventions to reach to that scale um, thanks for your question, Rahul. Um, when, when I look at to scale and how we define uh, scaling, um, we look at three things and really that's the cornerstone of how we sort of look at business ideas and decide how do we, you know, do, do we want to partner with this business champion? The first one is, <clears throat> Is it going to make contributions towards enhancing the terms of access for low income consumers? As you know, Africa is about 70% um, um, informal markets and a huge chunk is low income consumers. So when we look, when we look at um, the partnerships that we are in and you know, looking at scaling, in terms of access to BOP consumers, we, we look at things like affordability, accessibility, awareness, and acceptability. When you understand low-income consumers and you're looking at how, for example, the product that we've developed is going to you know, enhance the terms of access to BOP consumers, then we can already tell that the product will move. So in, in, in terms of how uh, we support the champion to, to get to these four, these four pillars of access is we help them through product development, branding, um, creating awareness through activations, and also helping them build structures around distribution. So when we are looking at, um, when you're looking at a partnership, and we are trying to figure out, okay, the end product, how does it contribute uh, to, to low income consumers? So when you take these four things, then we know, okay, this, you know, this is very viable. The second, um, the second potential that we look at is, does it increase terms of inclusion for smallholder farmers? Um, like I said, when you look at food and nutrition security, you cannot leave out the production side. Because uh, production, things like handling of food, post-harvest loss, all of these things contribute towards uh, food and nutrition security. So working on what for us, what um, terms of inclusion for smallholder farmers means is do they have a voice, the smallholder farmer? Do they have a voice? Um, what's their decision-making power? Can they negotiate? So when you look at the clusters that we help build, uh, that we support, um, we are looking to increase terms of inclusion to smallholder farmers. Because if they're able to negotiate, if they have a relationship with the business champion, then it means that um, they're sort of sure that when I produce, my, my produce will be bought by the business champion, right? And also for the business champion, they are almost sure if I want to scale, I have sufficient supply of produce. So when we look at that end uh, of, for example, value chain and what that looks like, it helps us understand 
the potential for scaling. So if there's no relationship in there, then it means uh, the business champion, it doesn't matter what, if, if they come up with the best product in the world for low income consumers, but they cannot um, get sufficient supply or they have a bad relationship with the smallholder farmer, then it means nothing because they'll only reach a small percentage based on what they're able to, to collect. Um, and the third one is improving competitiveness. So I keep talking about um, inclusivity, uh, youth, women, um, we all, we always want to work with youth and women because we think about um, sustainability and some of them are better uh, in some areas along the value chain than others. As an example, um, on the distribution side, and we are talking about food, um, sometimes, you know, you, you have women selling a nutritious food, but they are more they are more capable of reaching another woman who makes the decision about food and nutrition at home than a man is. So just uh, being able to see okay what what does it look like along this value chain in terms of um, including women because we are selling food. Um, what are the youth doing? Uh, for example, the youth have the energy to perhaps um, there's one interesting thing I saw we are doing in Ghana where they have young young people um, roasting pieces of chicken at funerals and that's working so it's just it, it's a matter of um, looking at where can we um, where can we find different types of people and for inclusivity and what can they do um, also on competitiveness um, from the business champion perspective are they offering the the smallholder farmer a good price? And if they're not, are there other markets available for farmers to go to? So just looking at how competitive um, that value chain is allows us to understand uh, whether, you know, scaling is a possibility um, or not. Yeah, that's, that's my answer. Shatandi, uh, Eddie, uh, in, in your particular case, uh, and given our experience with the other social enterprises in the sector, there are largely two channels that any social enterprises operate on. A, it could be an institutional buyer, uh, likes of WFP, UNICEF, or, or uh, it could be even government. And B, it could be a direct uh, a consumer. Now, in your case, you are following both the channels. Uh, but at a, at, a, at a limited scale. So what are your plans? Uh, would you like to, uh, are there any preferences for a particular channel? Or do you see one channel uh, taking you to that particular scale? Uh, how do, right. What are your plans on that? Right. Um, so when we think about how we become a $100 million a year turnover business, um, we kind of have to throw the kitchen sink at it. Um, and especially when you're uh, just beginning, especially when you're trying to build your own brand, it takes a long time to build distribution and build the brand and trust and education. Um, and so in particular, uh, uh, some of our partnerships are playing role early on in, a lot, in, in kind of boosting turnover and helping develop the market uh, as we build our own brand. So to, to break it down a little further, there's four verticals to our business. The first vertical is, um, you know, what I, what I think from our investors' perspective, is where you create real value, which is your own brand, which is your own brand that has, you know, uh, uh, the trust of your consumers and your own distribution channel. And so, um, you know, we have a range of 35 products under our own brand called Hashikushi, and we're always creating new products, um, developing new products, taking products off the market that aren't working, growing our our distribution channel, um, and that is you know, what I hope to be the real, the real future of the business. Um, but we have three other verticals that we're also using that allows us to build revenue scale and also impact scale. The second is, is of the verticals is working with other large companies in Bangladesh um, to help them develop uh, fortified snacks that they can push through their channels with much better known brands. So the best example is, is uh, SMC, the social marketing company, which has been around for, for 40 plus years it, you know, has 80% of the market in ORS, which is the core treatment for dehydration during cholera, um, as well as the 80% of the market in contraceptives. 
super trusted, um, incredible distribution. Um, and so we've developed a, a product for them called Super Kid. They, they have the budget to bring on the captain of the cricket team to be the brand ambassador for it. They're able to push it through their channel. Um, and uh, that's been really great. We learn a lot from them. We're now developing another product, a soft drink powder that's fortified. Um, that's kind of a non uh, a non pharmaceutical uh, grade soft drink powder that's fortified, um, called fruity. And um, you know, so so that's so that's really great. Uh, and it also allows us to you know utilize our, our factory, uh, distribute our factory overhead over a, a, you know larger volume. Certainly, B two B contracts are much easier to deal with. Large B two B contracts are much easier to deal with. Um, even though the, the the sales cycle is much longer. Um, so that's the second vertical of the business. Uh, the third vertical of the business is working with uh, the government and with uh, INGOs and, and the UN. Um, and so we are right working with the World Food Program now with, with the Rohingya population on two pilots that have taken a long time to get going. If the, the sales cycle is long for big private companies, it's even longer for, for, the, for you know, UN organizations or governments. Um, but finally, we have been able to break ground on, on two pilots, which is fantastic. Um, and that's part of the business that I'm really passionate about um, that I think allows us to scale our impact in a really important way because, uh, you know, one question we get a lot is, well, how do you know that you're reaching the right customer? How do you know that your customer is malnourished? In a market like Bangladesh, you've got to, you know, if you if you throw a rock in most places in Bangladesh, you'd hit someone that you have 50% chance of them being malnourished. And by selling products that are really low cost, those are going to be generally the, the population. But if we really want to target the folks that need it absolutely the most, um, refugee populations and um, populations that are serviced by uh, uh, INGOs and the government uh, are, are going to be a really high impact area for us to work um, and, and scale up. Um, of course, working with those organizations and working with private organizations um, as well uh, helps build trust, uh, consumer trust in our brands um, and our company, which is really important. It can't be, can't be overstated um, how important it is to build trust around a product that's, that is providing nutrition. You know, we run into a problem trying to sell products at five cents and 10 cents. The, the consumer is, uh, has been so burned by the experience of low cost products being low quality um, and not being nutritious that it, uh, there's a ton of suspicion. Like how could we be selling something that actually is good for you at that price point? Um, and so by having partnerships with other people that they do trust uh, is, is a really good way for us to, to build that kind of intangible value in, in our brand. Um, and then the fourth area for, for growth is in export. And we're really at the very beginning stages of that. We're working on our first shipment to the Congo um, uh, now. And we think that there's tremendous opportunity um, uh, for both impact and for business. The countries with the, the youngest populations and highest rates of malnutrition are also those that have the fastest growing economies and where the snack food markets are, are red hot. So. Um, we think that there's a real opportunity in export and eventually in, in, in partnership, uh, joint venture or, or, or other types of franchising, um, but that's much further down the road. So those are some of the ways we're thinking about growth. Thank you. Uh, and now when there is a strategy and a plan to scale up, one of the essential elements is uh, to have that enabling environment and wherein you, uh, whether it is policy or legislations, uh, or partnerships that play an essential role. Uh, are you specifically highlighting an example wherein not all governments are uh, too keen on having RUTM as a, as a solution? Uh, this is a case, in, this is one case in point. Now, similarly, what are your expectations in terms of creating that enabling environment that will help you in uh, scaling up your business operations and uh, reaching the numbers that you intend to? Um, well, I mean, it's it's not just one example. It's the example for us. Uh, it's, you know, um, incredibly challenging. Uh, of course, it all comes from a, from a good place, um, being really concerned around um, breast milk substitutes and the marketing of breast milk substitutes, really focusing on um, uh, exclusive breastfeeding through at least the first six months, um, is, is uh, the right approach and, and backed by evidence, um, but how that has translated into policy um, really prevents a lot of work that could be done 
to support the nutrition of, of families uh, outside of that window or women who are unable to breastfeed. Uh, and so um, it's really challenging. Uh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a good answer. I mean, all, all I can say is that by, by doing the work and, and in particular building the relationships um, with, the with, that, with the various actors, you can kind of demonstrate your intent um, and kind of look at the evidence together and generate new evidence together. That's why it's really important for us to be working with teams of you know, independent scientists who, who are able to, uh, you know, uh, who uh, there's, there's less suspicion of their intent, right? Because there's, there's been such bad experiences in the past between governments and large multinationals working in nutrition. Um, and over time, we've been able to make progress that I wouldn't have thought was possible. You know, we've been working on this for four years now, and um, we're starting to, to have conversations with the Ministry of Education and, and think, talking about school feeding for adolescents and the Institute for Public Health and Nutrition and um, even the World Food Program. Uh, these are, are, are conversations that have come a long way, and, and a lot of it is just based on um, demonstrating your intent and your authenticity and the work that you're doing being really responsive to feedback and understanding the concerns of, of partners um, and, uh, and, and putting the time in, that's it. Rahul, I think we lost you. Sorry about this. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, but we can't see you, yeah. unfortunately. There we go. Okay. Uh, now coming on to uh, the from the BOP perspective, uh, partnerships again uh, for you, uh, and you've talked about your partnership into, with the government also. You've also talked about creating those local uh, business hubs as well. Now, how do you look at scaling up those local business hubs, wherein there are a couple of challenges? There would be challenges related to and you mentioned a word sufficient production. And when we are challenging in terms of self-consumption and to have that surplus, how do you look at addressing those challenges? And also from a, uh, what are those uh, enablers in terms of access to technology, access to market that you would like some solutions on? Um, so, very interesting um, what, what Eddie was talking about, uh, the big institutional uh, buyers. So the SMEs that we work with um, have one big challenge for, you know, some of them have been selling to World Food Program for a very, very long time. And one of the reasons that we, we work with them is because now they are interested in local markets. So um, as an example, there's a cooperative in, in, in South Sudan that has been selling maize to World Food Program. But the challenge they have is that the payment terms are not um, very, they're not very good because you have to wait for a long time. And, you know, like Eddie said, the sales, the, the sales cycle is quite long. So one of the reasons uh, we pick um, SMEs that have, you know, they already have something um, uh, happening is so that they can diversify their portfolio, right? And when you look at low income markets, most of, most of these markets are cash, uh, the cash markets. So the, the challenge that SMEs have when it comes to scaling is cash flow. That is one of the biggest challenges they have. And low income consumers provide an opportunity to manage the two. So if you're stuck to big institutional uh, buyers, then you're going to, you need like a substantial amount of credit to be able to serve them. But if you are also selling to low, low income consumers, because it's a cash business, it allows you to be able to continue serving the big institutional buyers. So that is one of the ways we approach um, um, the scaling up uh, for, for the businesses that, that we work with. Um, on the production side, um, um, I talked about agribusiness clusters. So it's difficult for a business champion to talk to one farmer, one smallholder farmer. We don't expect them to do that. That's difficult. So sometimes they prefer to work with aggregators, but then also an aggregator can become a processor and vice versa. So what we do is part of the technical support we provide is to have uh, the business support services 
help the farmers create clusters. So we create clusters around different value chains. And you know, there's power in numbers. When you come together as a cluster, then remember I, I talked about terms of inclusion to smallholder farmers. They now have a voice, they can negotiate. So in terms of, of business, in terms, you know, because they are big in numbers, then you can think about input suppliers. Yeah, when they are big, all of them together, you can train the, you can train them on a coefficient production. Um, you can train them how to produce more in their small in their small plot. So many many things that you can do at that cluster level. So once a cluster is connected to a business champion, and the clusters know that they are going to receive X price per kilo for whatever produce, then you know they won't think about a different market. And if the price is competitive there's no side selling. So in the relationship, you have farmers getting a good price, uh, farmers, you know, capacity development in terms of producing, um, you know, more. And, you know, even sometimes, you know, access to seed is, is a challenge. And those are some of the support, that's some of, some of the support that we give um, on the production side. So once you look um, after that, and even within the, the, the clusters, we have things we call VSLAs, village savings and loans. Yeah, they start putting money together in a small box, and then eventually uh, they're able to, you know, uh, open a bank account or you know be financially included in whatever way, and that allows them also to access financing. So when you look at the the farmer side, once you give the support on that side, and they are able to to fund, they are able to produce, they have access to inputs, then there's sufficient produce for the business champion to process. And then they can serve their big institutional buyer and they can serve uh, the, low, the low income consumer. So, um, but, I mean, that, that's how we look at uh, the strategy for, for, for scaling. So it's in, the, it's in the technical support that we give um, that we give the different actors within the value chain. And I think um, as, as, we, as we go about our interventions, we have something that's very key to the partnerships, which is under governance, right? So the, the, the governance structure includes a smallholder farmer, an input uh, uh, provider, you've got the business champion, you've got distributors. So all together, they are the ones who come up with interventions to help build the value chain. So when you look, when you look at the, the strategy altogether, is to bring up everybody along the value chain so that you know comp competitiveness, uh, sufficient supply, um, all of these things that leads towards you know, food and nutrition security. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Thanks, Shadandi. Um, see, as we at uh, IntelliCap, uh, the, uh, the, the main, uh, one of the main pillars for our work is for looking at gender mainstreaming across various sectors. And Shatendi, you had talked about the women as influencers. Uh, we have seen examples in Bangladesh, uh, in, the, in the Rohingya camp, uh, the work that we are doing, wherein they have created mother-to-mother -mother group and mother acting as influencer, influencers for uh, promoting uh, the, the new appropriate nutrition behavior. Uh, now, Shatandi, uh, across the value chain, what all, how are you ensuring one, of course, as you said, Apologies, it looks like we lost Rahul. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Uh, hmm? Can you hear me now, Shatandi? Uh, another? Mm -hmm. So if you can, across the value chain, if you uh, can highlight the aspects where you are looking at uh, mainstreaming gender, uh, not only from the production aspect. And Eddie, uh, if you can talk about from, in terms of as a, as an entrepreneur or more from the consumption side, are you also looking at aspects related to gender mainstreaming in your business model? Uh, I, I um, 
Okay, um, thanks Rahul. I'll, I'll ask also Nick to give an example that I know he personally worked on. Um, so when the way we look at gender, we look, like you said, uh, we look at the different nodes uh, on the production side and on the, on, on the, distri on, on the distribution side. Um, and one of the places where we find a lot of women is on the distribution side. So we have activities uh, um, that help us um, improve support and increase the number of women um, in the value chain. So um, as an example for Nigeria um, in one of our SOGAM partnerships, there's a local, uh, there's a local product called Fura Balls. They're made out of SOGAM. So it's a, it's a staple you'll get on the streets everywhere, but how they were, how they were being produced was very un unhygienic. So to, to, help, um, to help women, I think they're part of the, of the cooperative uh, in, in, that, in that value chain, we, we thought of an idea of training them how to prepare this furable, um, you know, hygienically and packing it um, and then selling the hygiene aspect to the end consumer. Uh, so that's worked out really well because um, we did a deep dive earlier this year to, to understand what's been the impact of training this event to prepare it hygienically and packing it hygienically. And you know, this, this is, was one way for us to find alternative markets for the farmers outside of selling to a business champion because you know, to make the value chain competitive, farmers need to be able to sell to anybody. So we always work on, um, you know, we work with food vendors quite a lot to help enhance what they're doing so that they're able to sell more. And one of the things that stood out to me um, on the deep dive that we did was there are a lot of comments around, you know, someone would say, I ate, fur I ate a fura ball and my, I didn't have a running stomach, which is really what we were going for. And they say now they feel confident uh, buying fura balls because they know they've been well prepared and well uh, and well packaged. So that that's one way we are approaching um, gender mainstreaming, um, at least on the distribution side. Another way is we have we have pockets of women um, um, on the on, on the distribution side um, who who can act as distributors or we would call them. Um, independent sales agents. And we do a lot of work in training them on, on business skills and how to, how to sell, how to move more product and, and things like that. Uh, but I think uh, Nick perhaps has a better example from the GATS Agro partnership that we have that you know, sheds more light on what that looks like. Nick. Yeah, thanks Malika. Now I think, uh, of course we have worked in a number of businesses, so um, but I think what Shitandi uh, just mentioned, we can see in other businesses as well. Uh, so as she said, you, you don't look at the one particular part of the business, but you try to have a gender lens on the various parts of the business model and then try to see where, where you can unlock the potential of, of basically actively involving um, more women, for instance. And in the case of Gazagro, that, that really worked out well as they developed a... Uh, uh, yeah, female-led agent network. Um, and one of the benefits there as well is that, uh, especially- I will when, mute. I think uh, if you can't hear me, I'm sorry. Um, okay. You're good. Thanks. Um, and I think the benefit especially uh, is twofold as well, because, and I'm pretty sure Eddie also uh, can talk about that, but especially when it comes, for example, to, to child nutrition or, infant nutrition, not, not, not let's say on specifically for the for the young, the young let's say for uh, children, let's say from two, two to 10 and, and because Agro had a specific porch uh, solution for that, is that also uh, sort of women to women uh, conversation. So a female sales agent talking to a female customer actually can also drive the uptake since uh, she does influence, of course, the, the purchasing being made uh, at the home. So I think that is interesting as well to, to see that, you know, um, that approach actually really re yields uh, a lot of results on that front. Thank you. So, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, Eddie, please, please go ahead. 
Um, so it's, Bangladesh is a really interesting example for a bunch of reasons, um, but uh, one is specifically around female um, participation in the labor force. Um, so the you know the largest industry in Bangladesh, the largest generator of of, of foreign capital, uh, foreign cash reserves, is the garments industry, and and employs about four and a half million people, and eighty percent of them are women, um, which is sort of a unique case. Um, and I think there are some industries that really lend itself well to that. There's parts of food manufacturing that really lend itself well to it. Um, for example, uh, packaging um, for us uh, is done exclusively by women. So we, you know, we have 40 women or something like that that are at our factory every day. Um, it's a little more challenging in some of the other parts of the manufacturing business where there's uh, heavy lifting required. Um, but it's a, even more than the, the physical requirements, there's a lot of cultural norms around roles that that women can can play and can't play. Um, and so coming in as a, as a foreigner and expecting that to change in just a couple of years, um, I think is an unreasonable expectation. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Nick made a great point that, uh, particularly for nutrition products, um, women as influencers uh, are tremendously powerful at the household level and even at the inter-household neighborhood level. Um, we would love to have a sales force, uh, not even talking about the sales lady model going door to door, but talking about our core sales officer team that you know they visit 80 outlets a day. Um, I think that would be really effective. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of security concerns uh, and it's not culturally a job that women are accepted in at this point. Um, so we run up against some of those, those issues um, when we think about where where there's really good opportunities, unique opportunities for women to 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 help improve our business. Um, so those are some of the some of the things that we're thinking about. Thanks, uh, and I do realize we have uh, 15 minutes of time, and I would now uh, like to take up the questions that have been raised, uh, and I can see in the chat box. Uh, the first question is uh, uh, Nick and Shatandi to to you, and this is raised. Uh, and I read it, they watch the biggest mistake you see businesses make when trying to create and launch new nutritious and affordable foods into markets like Ethiopia. Uh, Shatandi, this is for you. And right. Um, thank you for, for that question. Um, I think in our two skill experience, one of the things that we learned from I think, two skill one was around product development. So in two skill two, we made it a point to you know, we have a structured way of approaching um, launch of new products and, and things like that. And one of them, we, we do two very, very key things um, that help with, you know, for example, if you put a product into the market and it's rejected or you have issues because it's food, sometimes you have issues uh, as an example where you have uh, yogurt in, in, you know, usually they're, they're packed in these little cups it's swollen because you know there, there are quality issues there but then just how to approach all of that we have a structured way of doing it so um as a, as perhaps um an answer is we always have an insight study done to understand what are the consumption habits you know what does demand look like what's in the market um how is everyone else doing it at this point, you have a product in mind, right? Once that is done, then we hold something called a BMC workshop. BMC is Business Model Canvas. And you know this is something that we do for a lot of the SMEs. Most of them don't have a documented um, um, you know, business model or business plan. And we, we use this opportunity to help them do that. But with a very, very big focus on the marketing aspect. So we really, really drown, uh, um, we really go down to um, making sure that the, the business champion understands who the market is, who is their customer, you know, to a point of um, like, you know, we do these things called cu uh, customer persona, where, you know, you say, what's their age group, uh, where do they work, how much do they earn, so that they really understand who their customer is, right? And once that is done, then we start to focus on product development 
based on the insights we got from the insight study, right? Uh, but I think um, also one of the things that we've learned is um, being able to make mistakes quickly and, and you know, and change. So a, lo a lot of the champions we have, uh, you know, when you work with entrepreneurs, this is one of the reasons, you know, we, we call them resilient because they're able to bounce back after things like that. But being able to see, oh, this is not working, let's change. So these are the things we try to teach them uh, in, when we're giving them support, um, the technical support, just understanding that this is not working and quickly changing to what works for the market. And also very importantly, listening, getting feedback once you launch. So the activities that we have planned when, when they're launching products, the activations, this is where we make noise, we go with people in t-shirts, tasting of, of the product. And the feedback that you get uh, from those activations is what helps them tweak and refine the product so that it's right in the market. Um, another thing I would say that is quite critical is um, for because low income markets, and I, I speak for low income markets in, in general, is that um, they, are, they can be forgiving, right? But what they don't like is, for example, out of stocks. Because if they come and ask for a product once, twice, they don't find it, they'll move on. Now it's your job to find them. So uh, we always ensure that everything is planned in terms of activations and distribution so that they work hand in hand and the distribution uh, system is well established that you know, we help them build those relationships to ensure you know, uh, when the product is good, the customers know about it, they accept it, it fits their pocket, then it's always available. So um, in, in so many words, um, these are the things that we do to help um, our business champions when they are launching new products into the market to help them to, to ensure that they are successful. Thanks. I now take the other question, which is again uh, uh, for view being, uh, and it, I read, what is the future of small scale farmers in developing countries after agricultural mechanization has been attained in these uh, economies? Um. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, uh, let me, yeah, maybe I'll just pass that one on to Eddie. <laughs> no, I think, uh, but maybe that also relates a bit to our, the take on the challenges. So I, I just wanted to go back to that point as well. Is that, as you know, I think hopefully it's clear from the from this entire session as well. Is that as two skill we try to recognize that you know working on a, a SME in nutrition or an intervention, there are so many different uh, things that are important. Uh, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, making sure that you link to the market. We talked about regulatory stuff. We talked about sourcing. Um, and I think the, the pitfall, what we sometimes see is like on one hand, as an entrepreneur, even in Ethiopia, you need to have a holistic view on all these different areas. And I think also as a program, you somehow need to take all of that into account. But at the same time, if you spread yourself too thin, uh, you're also not able to really get anything done, right? And I think as a program, sometimes we also get lost. Is, you know, we don't want to be the, 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 the program that just gives you like a small you know, investment and then leaves. No, we want to be there for you on all these different fronts, but it also sometimes dilutes you know, your actual intervention. And I think as an entrepreneur, that is also a bit of the pitfall is that if you only would focus on creating an awesome brand, you know, you might lose out on your distribution. Are you focusing on your distribution? You might not have a competitive offer. Um, so I think that is, um, I think that's the challenge for both SMEs, but also for programs is to find that middle ground. And um, yeah, and, and do try to make sure you move forward and not get lost in the swamp as well. Um, and then in terms of the, the smallholder farmer, uh, honestly, it's a very, uh, I think already with Eddie in the pre-session, we discussed this as well, is that as, as Shitani said, we, we try to support local sourcing, you know, and in a number of countries, especially in Africa, you know, local sourcing is still extremely tough. So, uh, I, I, you know, we, we talk that sometimes there is the need to import uh, goods. So whether again, it's mechanic, mechanic uh, let's say, 
professionalized farming or smallholder farmers is I think if you want to source local, you cannot ignore the smallholder farmers in basically all the BOP markets. So uh, especially for the coming decades, you know, those definitely need to be incorporated if you really want to uh, aim for, for local sourcing. But oh, maybe, Eddie, you can also reflect a bit on the challenges and, and the sor- uh, smallholder farmer part from your perspective. Yeah, Rahul, if we have time, I'd love to say a couple of words, but if we have to move on, that's fine. No, no, Eddie, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so for us, you know, uh, part of our innovation was trying to take a product that traditionally was made with peanuts and, and figuring out how to make it with things that are more relevant to, to, to consumers here, more, more abundant um, and cheaper. Things like lentils and chickpeas and rice, which are eaten every single day. Uh, and I guess my expectation coming in was that these are products that we were going to be able to, 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 to source locally. But it became clear very quickly that for um, the consistency of quality and price, um, it just wasn't possible. Um, so, th- and that was really surprising. Most lentils are imported from Canada into Bangladesh, which is sort of crazy. Um, but I mean, and that's true with a lot of agricultural in- inputs. I mean, that's un- also unique to Bangladesh. It's a tiny country um, and uh, the government is really focused on producing rice. And so, you know, sugar, wheat, oil, edible oils are all imported. Um, I think it also has to do with, you know, uh, customer preferences and understanding the importance of sourcing locally and what that does to your community as a, as a consumer. So, it, a major trend in, in, in wealthier parts of the world is really focusing on, on products that are, are produced locally and paying a premium for that. Um, and, and you get stuck in between, as you always do, between uh, kind of the, the cost of, and, and pricing and uh, other values, whether it be the nutritional content or you know, where your goods are sourced from um, or how they're packaged. Uh, and you 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 run into that constraint really quickly. So I, I don't know what the what the future holds, but um, at least in parts of the world where where mechanization has really taken over in the U.S., for example, um, with big soy and corn, you're seeing a return of some kind in some small scale at this point to people thinking about um, trying to source products and, and and brands and companies developing products that are sourced locally um, as a as a source of value for them. And a source of value for the consumer, um, but of course that's not, by and large, the the trend uh, globally. If we think about total turnover. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, I'll move on to the next question, uh, which is for well, Eddie. You, uh, it's for you. Uh, and what has been the outreach outreach strategy for Frontier Nutrition to market the product? Uh, and what has been your experience or learning with regard to feedback from your consumers? and incorporating the same in your strategies? That's a lot. Um, So we've tried a lot of stuff. Um, Bangladesh, again, is a unique market. The the media market is is really fragmented. Uh, And and for example, um, local television channels are not super popular. Most, the most popular channels are are piped in from India, but there's regulation that says that you can't advertise if you're a Bangladeshi company in India, you have to only advertise on Bangladeshi channels, for example. Um, there's not kind of a, a unified radio presence, so it's very hard to, to do that. Same thing with newspaper and print. Um, digital penetration is still pretty low, only about 30% of people have smartphones and are on the internet. Um, and those aren't, there's not a lot of overlap with our target markets. Um, so that's really tough. Um, so we focused a lot on um, BTL market activations and, uh, you know, going store to store, going market to market and doing sampling, going door to door and doing sampling, kind of creating a, a little kind of, uh, uh, Shandi said, making a lot of noise. So we tried doing that. Um, uh, we would like to do and had, have had plans to do more work in schools and with schools. Um, and in kind of maternal clinics and, and, and mother groups, but we've been negatively affected over the last two years by COVID and we haven't really been able to do that. Um, so uh, the jury is out on, on what works. Um, and again, it's, it's slow going. Uh, I think if you, have a, if you have 
infinite money to throw at the problem, then it becomes easier because you can just blast every channel. Um, and, and, uh, and it's also easier if you can do it digitally because you can measure the return and it's really hard to do otherwise because brand building is not something that happens in one activation or 10 activations. It happens over years um, as people build habits and get to know you as a brand. Um, so that's on, on the marketing side. What was the second half of the question? It's more on how do you incorporate the feedback in your strategy? Feedback from the market? Yeah. I mean, uh, Shatandi just gave us a five minute masterclass in, in what we're, what we try and do all the time, which is, uh, talk to consumers who are eating the product. We talk a lot to the, the, the retail, the shopkeepers for us, that's the major influencer. Um, so our, you know, we have 70,000 stores, which sounds like a lot, but the footprint of each one is, you know, maybe a hundred square feet on average. And so those are really the, the person that is going to be interfacing most with the customer, making recommendations to them and getting a lot of feedback because they see what moves, they see what people have to say about it. So it's a lot of talking to, to retail shopkeepers through our sales officers. Um, and, uh, and then it's changing. We, we're constantly changing. Um, you know, we're, even within the same product, we're changing it to figure out the viscosity. How does it have to be in summer versus winter because of temperature changes? Uh, how do we make sure that it stays emulsified? Um, you know, uh, what flavors are, are, are popular? What flavors could we try that people haven't tried before? Um, you know, what's not working and let's take it off the market and let's, you know, put something else out there. So it's really constant. Um, we're developing on average something like eight or nine products a week. And most of those will never see the light of day, but um, it's kind of a constant constant iteration. Thank you. And then, then the last question that we have, and this relates to uh, increasing acceptance amongst the community for the nutritious food. Uh, and the question is, what actions can be taken to specifically improve acceptance of nutritious food among the local communities? Uh, Shatandi, Nick, and this, this can be common to all. Uh, it's a sometimes the million, seems the million dollar question. And um, yeah, I think I tried to show some examples that we try to apply where you can think through certain strategies that increase the likelihood of uptake. But then of course, <laughs> that's only, you know, one of the, the things to take into consideration because execution afterwards is key. So I think that is where, you know, especially in the early days, it's interesting to look at those strategies, but like Eddie is doing, then it comes about you know, also eventually, of course, driving the distribution of the products and so forth and so forth. So I think, um, yeah, that, that will be my response. I think we, something that we've sort of um, adopted because this is so hard is figuring out ways to, uh, for lack of a better term, Trojan horse the nutrition in, like figure out where consumers already are and, and what are their habits and then how can we improve on those products? Um, and, and at the same time, by doing that, you build uh, the brand and the trust and the, and the presence so that you can start to create things that are a little bit different than have, I mean, I, I don't know about other markets, but in Bangladesh, um, the, the consumption habits are so fixed from the time of day to the exact product that you eat. Um, and so changing that is, is, takes time and is, is really hard, but you can figure out ways to get closer to where consumers are. Um, and that's what we're trying to do now as we, as we build out the various channels and kind of uh, uh, build out the brand. Thank you. And we've just uh, received another question and we started our question, uh, question answer session with biggest mistake you see in business uh, when you're trying to launch a new product. And here the question is, what would you say is your biggest learning while uh, moving into a new territory or new space? A quick response from uh, Eddie and Shikandi. Um, I would say just listening to what the market is saying because I think every market is, is, is different in, in its own way, to in its own way, they've got their own habits. And I think um, 
Yeah, let me say context. Context is, is, is um, the biggest thing that, I mean, that's been my biggest learning. Like when you, when you go somewhere, you learn, they say, when you go to Rome, do what the Romans do. I think for me, my biggest learning when going into new markets has been understanding context and connecting that context. Uh, I mean, uh, integrating that context into your product. Um, that's been my biggest uh, learning. Any uh, quick response? Yeah, I think kind of at a, at a more micro level, something that we struggled with in expanding early on was thinking about um, the cost of transportation and kind of the logistics. So if we think about expanding into a geographic territory, it doesn't matter if you have someone who's really excited to work with you or ready to, ready to invest without a return right away. Um, if you can't rationalize the cost and make sure that, as, as Shatandi pointed out earlier, that there can be product there that's high quality on a regular basis um, without eating up all of your margin, um, it's not gonna, it doesn't matter how, how strong that partnership is. So sort of growing in concentric, concentric circles or around a route um, makes life so much easier. So that's definitely a mistake that we've made more than once. Okay, thank you. I guess we've uh, uh, almost crossed our time and uh, would like to, on behalf of the Sankal team, I would like to thank all your panelists uh, for highlighting how the strengths of the private sector in terms of uh, bringing in efficiency, highlighting uh, or rather creating innovations, uh, looking at understanding of consumer insights and bringing that into the business model and also influencing consumer behaviors. Uh, and how have these been factored into designing context specific market led approaches? So thank you very much for highlighting that. And I'm sure uh, all our uh, participants who are, some of them are social enterprises uh, may have uh, benefited from it. Thank you all uh, for your time and thank you participants for your attention. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.